that I have done something that no man should have to do. I have gone down the Java rabbit hole. The jabbit hole. I have seen things that no man should see, and I have experienced the nonsense, the ridiculousness, the arguments, the wars in the comment sections of Stack Overflow posts asking simple things like, what is the difference between thread sleep and waiting on an object's monitor. But you can interrupt a sleeping thread. In that case, wait is redundant. In fact, waste CPU cycles too, sad face. Why in the world do you say wait wastes CPU cycles? But while I was in this deep dark place, I realized this would make great content. And so today I'm gonna to be your tour guide through the land of Java multi-threading. And we're going to experience one particular exhibit that I find quite amusing and bizarre. I'm doing this at the cost of my own sanity for the sake of my viewers. All 674 of you psychopaths that watched an 8 minute and 49 second video about Java for loops. <laughs> I promise I only refresh the page like 300 times. So that means there are at least 374 of you guys that are real and watching that content. Oh, I'm getting a call. Oh, it's my TikTok famous friend. Hey, what's up, dude? Hey man, what's up? Listen, I've just been uh, stumbling across your page on YouTube, oh, and I've cool. been loving your content. I've just been trying to support you. I've refreshed your most recent video like 374 times or something like that, just to boost the views. Yeah, I feel good. Hello? Anyway, so this all started because I wanted to show you guys about static and instance initialization blocks in Java. So what I have here is a static initialization block and an instance initialization block. So the static initialization block is going to run once at the initialization of the main class. And the instance initialization block is going to run before every constructor uh, or any constructor of the main class. So I can show you guys an example with this. Let's say I put a pr system out print call in the static block, put A in the initialization block, let's put B. Let's create a constructor here for the main class we've got. And inside the constructor, let's print C. Then let's create a main method. And inside the main method, we'll print D. Then we'll instantiate a new instance of the main class. So let's take a look at what the order is of these letters. Okay, so let's run this and see the results. Okay, we see A, D, B, and then C. So first the static block ran, and then the main method. And then the instance initialization block ran. And then finally, the constructor. It works exactly as I just described. The static initialization block will always happen at the first initialization of this class and only once. And the instance initialization block will happen at the beginning of any constructor once it's called. So I was curious exactly how these static blocks work. So the first thing I wanted to check is, well, how about the ordering? Does the order matter of these static blocks? So if I put one at the very bottom here, and label it E, will it happen before A every single time? So we can run this again. And we see A, E, D, B, C, we can run it again. But once again, see A, E, D, B, C. So it's safe to say that the static blocks also will execute in order from top to bottom. But the next thing I was curious about is, well, what if we put this in a thread? So let's create a new thread for this. And all our thread's gonna do is it's going to print the letter E, okay? So I'm curious if, we run this as a thread, will we see E printed later than the rest of the code? And if we run this, we see, okay, well, E is still being printed right after A. So maybe it's just too fast. Let's try sleeping before we print. So let's do thread.sleep, sleep for a thousand milliseconds. Of course, we need to catch interrupted exception. And let's run. We see A and we see it's waiting on the sleep and then E. So it looks like the static initialization blocks will actually cause the main method to block on any threads, or let's say like join on any threads that are running in those blocks before it's allowed to continue its execution. So that's something interesting to note about these static initialization blocks. So while I was looking into why exactly it works this way, I found this Stack Overflow post titled Thread Safety of Static Blocks in Java. And in this post, I found this user who commented, static block is always thread safe while it's getting initialized. This is the reason you use static variable of singleton object as one way of creating singleton object, parentheses, singleton dizzing pattern. Obviously this isn't very well written and it doesn't have any upvotes, but he did mention this thing called the singleton design pattern, uh, which I was 
curious about, so I did a quick Google search. I found this Wikipedia article about the singleton pattern in software engineering. It says the singleton pattern is a software design pattern that restricts the instantiation of a class to a singular instance. Okay, and I read through the rest of this article. I'll sum it up for you guys real quick. So consider this singleton object that I've created here. This singleton object has a private constructor, meaning that the only way to actually get an instance of it is through this get instance method. Now we're going to keep a single instance of the singleton method or of the singleton object right here. And we're going to be utilizing a term called lazy initialization. And that's that it's only going to be initialized once somebody requests an instance of the singleton object. Uh, and when they request one, we're first, we're going to check if it's already been initialized. If it hasn't, we're going to create a new object and then we're going to return that new singleton instance. So again, if it, was already initialized, then we would just return that single instance of it. However, there's a race condition here, and that's that if two threads were to get try to get an instance of the singleton object at the same time, um, they might accidentally create two singletons because this is not thread safe. So in order to prove it, I created this test here. So I created a main method. One thread is going to try to get an instance of the singleton and the main thread is going to also try to get an instance of the singleton and then they're both going to log the objects that they get. So by logging it this way, it'll print the hash code of the object, which should tell us whether or not they're the same object. So if we run this, we see that it actually does get the same object. So what if we were trying to actually like force a race condition here to make things a little more realistic, we could actually have this sleep for let's try 10 milliseconds. By doing that, we can actually force a race condition. So now let's run this again, this time with the singleton object sleeping for 10 milliseconds before actually setting. And we see that we actually got two different objects this time uh, because they have different hash codes. So what this tells us essentially is that this is one way to create a singleton object, but in a multi-threaded environment, this is not thread safe. So how do we fix this? So one thing we could do is instead of using lazy instantiation, we could use eager instantiation and just create this here. But of course we want the benefit of lazy initialization. So that this is not a good solution. The other thing we could do is we could make this a synchronized block. By doing so only one thread can access this entire block at a time. But once again, this adds a little too much overhead that we don't actually need uh, and we should try to come up with maybe a better solution than this. So it says it turns out the best solution for this is to use turn this singleton object instance into a volatile class member. And then we can remove the synchronize keyword here and then we can synchronize on our object monitor and inside of this synchronized block create our singleton instance. Now since multiple threads could actually reach this point we still need to check once again uh, that the singleton instance hasn't already been instantiated and then we return the singleton instance much like before. All right, so this solution is called double checked locking. You can see that the two checks here to see if the singleton instance has already been instantiated. So this allows us to get the benefit of the synchronized block without having to actually enter a synchronized block every single time that we want to get an instance of our singleton instance, right? If we have so many threads that are requesting an instance of the singleton, then we shouldn't have them all have to wait on one another to finish. But seeing this solution on Wikipedia, it made me wonder, well, why do we need the volatile keyword here? And what exactly does it do anyway? So what it's supposed to do is supposed to ensure that the optimi an optimizing compiler like the JVM does not like cache instances of this object because it can be changed by uh, multiple threads. So this essentially is supposed to allow for visibility of this of changes to this object across multiple different threads. Now to actually test it out, I found this code online. You can tell this is not my code because I recommend actually implementing runnable rather than extending the thread class. But regardless, uh, what this code is essentially doing is it's making changes to a volatile int right here. Actually, let me make it volatile for you real quick. My int. And it's doing that every 500 milliseconds. Then another thread busy waiting on that value and waiting for it to change. And when it changes, it's going to log that it like received a change. Then we're going to do this from like one to five. So I'm going to run this code. So we see incrementing my int to one and got change, incrementing my int to two, got change. Etc. Okay, and then the authors claim that if you remove the volatile keyword here from my int and run the same code, you should see that the listener is unable to actually detect that there are changes to my int. And the reason for this is because the value to my int is being cached away by the compiler. Let's see if that's true. 
We see incrementations, but we don't see the change listener ever actually receiving them. And so our program is going to sit here and loop forever. Now that's when I discovered something kind of weird. So the first thing I tried doing was, well, what if I put a system out print here, just an empty print and run the same code. Again, our my integer right now is non-volatile. This shouldn't have an effect. Oh, but it actually does. Some of this allowed for visibility of the changes made to this my integer variable. But okay, this can be explained away if we actually look into the print method itself. When we look into write, we see that, oh, there's a synchronized block here. And so of course, whenever you hit a synchronized block or a volatile object, it's going to reset the cache essentially. It's going to force visibility. Okay, we can try sleeping for zero seconds in the change listener. See if that changes anything. And it does. Well, that's a little weird because we unfortunately can't really see, but, but it doesn't look like there's any synchronization or a volatile objects being hit in the sleep method itself. So I wonder what's going on there. Now the same thing goes for checking if we're, the current thread is interrupted. So if I run this, you should see that, yep, works as expected. Uh, if I were to do like get the current thread, this does not have any effect. You see here, we're gonna be infinitely looping. Uh, we can do other things like check if the current thread is alive but that actually will have an effect and enforce visibility. So I decided to do what any sane programmer would do, and that is beg for answers on Stack Overflow. So I posted on Stack Overflow, but uh, I still haven't received any answers that I'm satisfied with. But while I was researching to see if someone else had the same question as me, I found this absolutely hilarious thread titled Difference Between Wait Versus Sleep in Java. Now, when I first saw this, I was like, well, I mean, obviously they're, they're just two different things, right? You, you can sleep on threads and you can wait on monitors. But uh, when I looked at the answers, especially specifically this one that has 899 upvotes, by the way, he basically says just that, or he just kind of explains what wait and notify do and then uh, what sleep does, but he doesn't explain like why are there, why is there even a distinction between sleep and wait? Uh, because like, as far as I'm concerned, you can implement the same things with both, right? He does mention one thing, uh, which I've heard about before, which is the spurious wake ups from wait. I've actually never seen that in practice, but supposedly that can happen. But what I found hilarious was coming down to the comment section here and seeing the absolute just pandemonium that was going on with the arguments about whether wait or notify is the same or different than thread sleep. If thread sleep is actually implemented with wait and notify, of course our thread starts with no, it cannot. It can only be interrupted. Now, I don't know what he's referring to. I assume there used to be a comment that was deleted and he's responding, but it's kind of funny. Followed up by, but you can interrupt a sleeping thread. In that case, wait is redundant. In fact, waste CPU cycles too, sad face, says geek. When you're interrupting, you must know which thread you want to interrupt to. When you're calling notify, you just need to you just need object. You don't care if there is any other thread which waits on this object. Wait notify is used for communication while sleep is used for um, sleeping. And then Robert joins the fray. Why in the world do you say wait wastes CPU cycles? Unfortunately, the mysterious geek never does follow up and tell us why waiting wastes CPU cycles, but instead various other people join to just ask their own unrelated questions. Is thread sleep simply a higher level layer built atop of object wait? Or is it true that there are two separate things? Actually, that's a good question. And I'm also wondering the same thing. So we got a wait that can be notified, but we also got a sleep that can be interrupted. So comparing wait notify versus sleep interrupt, What's the difference? I read through all of the answers. However, I still feel a bit of missing information. Many people wrote down the definitions from the Java doc and also the meaning of the two English words, but I do not see why I should ever use sleep instead of wait. What is the benchmarking and speed difference between the two? If I can do everything that I can do with sleep, why should I ever choose to sleep? Now, I think he means if I can do everything with sleep with wait, then why should I ever choose to sleep? Personally, I think a lot of the confusion here is coming from the fact that some people are talking about using thread sleep inside of a synchronized block while others are not. Uh, and that's leading to like this discourse breaking down, but it's still pretty funny. It goes on and on. There, there are two more funny ones here. People just start asking questions completely unrelated. Well, not completely unrelated, but tangentially related. Can someone tell me why this question, difference between wait and sleep, is so hot for interviews? It's like comparing apples and oranges. As far as I understand, sleep is for halting execution and wait is for thread intercommunication, waiting for some condition. And then Ewoks jumps in to ask, Anyone why it's everywhere called monitor object and not monitored? So this inevitably got me wondering, why does nobody know? Do the Oracle devs even know? 
how this works, how thread.sleep is implemented. Is there a way to find out? I did, I searched for it, but I couldn't find anything. So the lesson here is that Java and the JVM are just a complete mystery, and it's better off not knowing what they do if you want to become a Java programmer. So thanks for attending my TED Talk. <laughs> that That's my conclusion. So thanks for watching my video. I hope that you <laughs> enjoyed learning a little bit more about Java and that you found it entertaining and also learn something along the way. If you like more content like this, don't forget to tell me down below and I'll see you guys in the next video. Like always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Peace.